and I ask that you please introduce yourself. Oh, hello, my name is Teresa Bettis. I am, uh, my day job is director for the Center for Fair Housing here in Mobile. Been a long time support for the African community. Started working within the community about 2012. Um, my question is going to be Mr. Harriet. Um, you mentioned the Mortis Montessori schools. Are you aware of the Mobile County Public Training School, which is a Rosenwald uh, school? So I, I misspoke when I said Montessori. I meant Rosenwald. You meant Rosenwald. Okay. okay. So the, 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 the uh, president of Sears, uh, I think his name was Arthur Rosenwald, right? Yes. Uh, so he basically, like 30% of black people um, who were educated in the school, graduated from uh, high school in the South, I think they calculated this in 1950. So from 1920 to like 1950, 30% of the black people who had a high school education were educated at a school, at a Rosenwald school, which meant not only had the, the guy from Sears helped them, but that it meant that black people had educated 30% of the, the people who had a high school education with no help from their state or local government, right? And then that only figures in Rosenwald schools. Some of them did it without Rosenwald schools. For instance, my mother went to a, a boarding school called Mather Academy. Um, and it wasn't a Rosenwald school. It was built by the wife of an abolitionist in Camden, South Carolina. Like her husband was killed in the Civil War and she came and built this school, this boarding school. So I think it's important to know, like, not only the, like, the education system that we built, this is, the, this is the important part. Like, we built it, and then they kicked us out of it and used what we built to give white people generational wealth and opportunity, because that's what education is. Then. And then we had to do it again from scratch for ourselves. So we built theirs and another one for us, right? Which is the reason that story is important. And one more thing, this is the first time I've heard you talk about the big, uh, in South Carolina is where formalized educational systems were created. I've never heard that and that it was turned by black people. Have you thought about writing a book about that or has it been written about? So I've written about it a few times. Um, and it is also in my book, Sarah's Blood, Black AF History. But so the concept of the American education system. So there were states that had public schools. They weren't equal for all. They weren't um, publicly funded. So, you know, you, unless you live basically in a city, it was up to your community whether or not you had a school. But South Carolina. The black people of South Carolina was the first to make it free, mandatory, constitutionally enforced, and put it in the state constitution. So what we know as the American education system is a, is a creation of black people in South Carolina. And, and black legislatures are in the South followed suit after the Civil War. Any other questions? Yeah, this one's from Ramsey. Ramsey, you know, we end up in a lot of meetings all the time these last few years, and I've watched you take abuse from people. I've watched you know, people try to run you out. I've watched people try to downplay what you say. How do you, uh, how do you keep coming back, man? How do you put all that to the side and, and just not throw your hands up? Man? Keep the faith. Yeah. Keep the faith. <laughs> Uh, I mentioned briefly about uh, having a chaotic childhood. You know, sometimes you earn a thick skin and it has its uses. Uh, and so I think, you know, in some ways, perhaps I was, I have a high tolerance for direct attacks upon my character uh, that don't, you know, they don't, and I'm not going to affect me. Uh, I worry about consequences of those outbursts, but my commitment 
unchanging. And in fact, you know, where there is conflict, I've made it a point to sit down with the people that have issue with my work and ask specifically with other people that share their concerns, like what is it? How do I do it better? Yeah, I've specifically said it's my it's my duty because your neighbors are telling me to be here to help with this particular work. It's my duty to suffer your opinion of me, good or bad. We can work it out. How do we do that? And you know, where there's reciprocity, there's reciprocity, and where there's not, there's not. And it's just you know, just move on and keep finding the people that want to work because there's plenty of them. Uh, not everybody has the time or the attention span or whatever, but you know, the, the, the nature of you know, being concerned about the environment in which you grow. You know, people talk about the environment as if it's just pollution, but it's, it's the environment in which you grow. It's, it's all the things. And when we talk about environmental justice, and when I talk about environmental justice, I'm talking about all the things. I'm talking about streetlights, sewage. I'm talking about how safe it is to walk to school. Can you cross the road? As much as I'm talking about the diesel pollution and the you know, dioxins and furans and the VOCs and the hazardous air pollutants and all the regulations that come along with all those things, all those things go into the environment. So there's somewhere we have common ground, right, with, with the people that have these differences of opinions. They may, not, they may feel really, really motivated for whatever reason to get you off the case of a particular company that they really just love for some reason, but they're not gonna fight you about their ancestors getting flooded in the cemetery and you're trying to do something about that and it's meaningful and impactful. They're not gonna fight you for long if you're actually getting somewhere with it. Okay, so my name is Ada. My question is for um, Mr. Harry. I just, I just, um, I was born in Africa, so I was, I came here early on. Um, in the, I'm not gonna say what year, but I'm gonna figure out my age. Good company. Um, say O2. That's a great answer. O2. Good company. O6. O6. No, no. No, but then you start guessing. So um, anyway, so I've often heard, and and I don't know whether what your opinion of this is, is that segregation was good for the black community, desegregation was bad. I mean, I, I want you to just tell me what your thoughts are on that, um, because it's important as as we learn about African American heritage and history that for me, I, I need to be clear on what what was and what is and what I, I should consider what should be and what's good for the community. So we've we've heard that, I think everybody in here has heard that, right? Like, segregation was good for black people and the reason they say that, right? First of all, it's not true, right? So saying you can't live wherever the hell you wanna live is not good for anybody, right? Now what they are talking about is that there were stronger communities when black people lived amongst themselves and that's a reason for that though. But the reason for that, they often leave out the reason for that is because we needed each other because everything else outside of our community was trying to kill us, right? <laughs> like, so like, you know how when people there's a saying, right, like the best friends are made in foxholes, right? It's cause like you really can make a friend if you stuck in a foxhole with people outside of the foxhole trying to kill you, right? But that don't mean foxholes are good for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> like it don't mean people trying to kill you are good for you, right? So the reason they say that is because, right, if you have a place that is black owned, that is a grocery store, that you can go to at any time because you can't go to the white grocery store at certain times, or because you can't bank in the black, in the white bank, or because you know you can't go 
to to uh, integrate the school. Now, I would argue, first of all, one of my arguments has always been that, like school, when it comes to education, schools were never integrated. Integration never happened. If you look up the definition of integration, is to to uh, combine two things equally. That was never happened. Black people were put into a white school system, right? So that's not integration. And so the and then what happened is all of those black teachers and educators and principals they were fired or demoted, right? So they weren't learning from black educators. And so that school system that existed before the end of segregation, because it wasn't integration now, remember, that school system might have been bene more beneficial to black people than being disregarded by that education system. But it still was underfunded. Again, we built it. You had to build your own school, right? So, but here's the ultimate thing about that, right? That black people, that statement. Like none of that stuff that existed before the end of segregation is illegal. Like we can still own black grocery stores. We can still build our own schools. We can still have our living, live amongst ourselves. So they didn't make any of that illegal. So I don't understand what that before the integration means because like we can still do all of that stuff, right? Some black people remove themselves. Oh, what's a little, like, one of the things about integration with segregation is like, you could, not only couldn't you live where you wanted to live, right? Like, black people were the only people where, like, a, a doctor essentially had to, was forced to live in a poor neighborhood, right? Like, you couldn't live wherever in the neighborhood you could afford. You had to live where white people told you, allowed you to live. And that's the important thing to remember about integration, right? And again, we were in a foxhole, and we were good friends in that foxhole. But we forget about the part about everybody outside the foxhole trying to kill us. I did it for everybody else, so I can turn the camera to me as well. Um, I want to know what influenced you to go in the realm or the work, to do the work that you're doing now? So like, Ramsey, what influenced you to champion environmental justice? Michael, what influenced you to um, champion like black empowerment and black history? Uh, so tell your story. Well, there's this thing that happens when you're a, a native person. Uh, people make a lot of stereotypes about what your interests are supposed to be, and you know they make jokes about the, the commercials that used to come on TV that portrayed native people, and um, you know so there, certainly like there's a not growing up in a, a native culture and being assigned uh, sort of this uh, like pastiche of concepts and personalities that were you know, not reflective of actual culture. Like coming into that as a young person and really getting to sit with what, and choose what of that I wanted uh, and being, you know, othered in that way growing up and seeing a, a, a clear difference in its neighbor, standards of neighborhoods, like my sense of justice was honed at a really young age, and I acted on it a lot in really variety of ways. That's what focused me, but it was like heavy metal and industrial music and punk music. It, that's what really like got me thinking critically about environmentalism as a whole, and then that you know being grounded and rooted in like my sense of like my sense of place. Like I knew I was from Homa, Louisiana. Uh, but I had never visited there, and so I, did, I read about it and read about it, and I knew the, about the oil industry was concerned about environmentalism, and, and it, you know, just over time, it refined itself, and I, I kind of got more and more concerned about refinery communities, and the more I learned about refinery communities, the more I learned about environmental justice as a discipline, and, and the social movements around that, and 
that that was the entree, and you know, it wasn't long before I realized, oh, I am a byproduct of environmental injustice. My, my parents weren't able to raise me in the bayou because of what was going on with the shipping industry. Uh, my, my father was a shipper, my grandfather's shipper, my grandfather, my grandfather, everybody. <laughs> so, you know, there's a, there's a couple of ways that you just kind of end up. You know, a lot of people talk about this too, like you become an accidental activist just by learning about your own circumstances. It's like exactly kind of my story too. Like, I want to say, I want to tell stories like, you know, my parents and my grandparents would sit me down and say, you gotta fight for black people or we are going to, but like, I wish it was like, it wasn't the time, it was like, you better get dressed for church. That's about it, right? Like, but so, but one of the things was I was homeschooled, so like, I kind of learned from primary sources. And the other thing is though, that when you are not indoctrinated with the lies, like it's again, like you don't have to do some deep research and find out who black people are or dig up the stories. Like we know who we are. It's just a layer of lies laid over everything. And if you don't have the lies, right? Like you, like everybody in here knows the story of black people, for but it's just a whole bunch of lies laid on top of that, a whole bunch of privilege. And so when you grow up in the absence of that, you don't really have to, to kind of say, I am going to be the sick. You know what I'm saying? You just be black, <laughs> right? Like I don't, I didn't, I wasn't around white people. I didn't learn lies, right? So whatever, I mean, everything I knew was like our stories unfiltered. And then when I started going to school, it was, you know, it was obvious like, oh yeah, I'm lying. <laughs> And so part of my thing was like, I never thought I was gonna be a saint. Like I was, like I still to this day, I feel like my job as a journalist, as a writer is, have you ever been in a, like, been in a place, like, and I'm gonna sound so hypocritical, y'all, cause like my wife accused me of doing this all the time. Like, cause she'll hear something and I'll say, yeah, I don't hear it. Are you ever been somewhere where like, you feel that way? And be like, I don't feel like that. That's how black people are in this country. Like, you feel that racism? And everybody be like, nah, nah, nah there ain't no racism. And all I'm saying is, like, all my job is really is, and y'all, y'all ain't crazy. I feel that racism too. Y'all ain't crazy. They lying, y'all. That's what it is. They lying. And you kind of know it's a lie because it don't make sense, right? It don't make sense. Like, we know that edu how valuable education is. Like, how does it make sense that they had to write the laws to stop us from, uh, from educating ourselves? How does it make sense that they threatened to kill us? How does it make sense that they had to chase? How does, it make, like, how does any of it make sense? Right? Like, we learn how to talk this language and teach ourselves to read. Like, how, how do we grow the crops and count the days and all the do the math and build this stuff without if we didn't care about education, it doesn't make sense. You are not crazy. They lie in y'all. Right? So, so that's the motivation. Okay. So uh, I'm Eric Finley, a native of Mobile. I have a question for both of you on the spread. Um, several weeks ago, uh, there was a community meeting on the asphalt plant that you spoke about. And um, it was well attended. But there were maybe three or four people that were in support of renewing their license. And it appeared that the majority of the people in the community was against it. And I believe the uh, Alabama Department of Environmental Maintenance did renew that permit. So uh, just hold that thought. Michael. Um, 
I need you to give us the cliff note version of the HR 40 bill on reparations, where it is, and, and for both of you all, how do we amp up a resolution for these types of issues? Because they've been floating around for quite some time. Thank you. <laughs> the asphalt plan. <laughs> There's nobody that lives next door to that plant that wants it there, that ever wanted it there. Uh, anybody that goes to the cemetery to honor their ancestors, if you're there during Monday through Friday during the day, you know it is like, it's, un it's ghastly, it's ungodly, it's awful, it's horrendous. And the fact that people living next door to that plant have been dealing with it for 25 years now is a crime. It was a crime when it was built. They didn't have the permits to build it. They built it, got 80% of the way through, and then the planning commission gave them two stop work orders, which they blew through, and then went down to the planning commission, and then the planning commission said, well, okay, how far along are you? Sounds good to me. It was, the fix was in from the very beginning, right? And those folks there on Chin Street have been suffering unbelievable harm. There's a lot of legal hooks that are, that were explored. But the, the fact remains, the biggest reason why that plant is able to operate the way that it is is because they don't think anybody except those people there that live there and have been there for 25 years are watching. We're gonna change that. We're gonna change that. And I want to invite everybody that might be interested in doing what I would call a, a company Chin Street or a company Africa Town campaign to, to be in touch with me because we're just going to have people camp there the whole time that they're open during the week. Watch them because we've seen when inspectors are there, they don't spew the way that they do when inspectors aren't there. And when inspectors show up, it's like they flip a switch and it doesn't do what it does all the rest of the time. And in fact, the state inspectors note this and have tried to get the company manager to tell them, what are you doing to stop spewing when we come around? Because we see it happen in real time. That hasn't been compelling enough for the state to do anything. We're, we've reached out to the, to the EPA to do a formal investigation. The EPA has this whole like FBI of the EPA thing that exists. But they don't take requests. <laughs> There's no tip line for them. We submitted a request. Maybe we're inventing something for this administration to institutionalize for these exact sort of cases. We know we have friends in Atlanta and in Washington, D.C. that care. To the extent that we're able to give them actionable intelligence and means to change programs and policies to, to, that can be universalized, like having an on-road for citizen tips about especially bad polluters, and that's not the only one. We're looking at Ivonic and Theodore, too, if you got people down in Theodore. You know, it's, it's the same mentality. Mobile County has three times more air pollution sources, permitted sources, than any other county in the state. Three times more, and the air program for Mobile County is egregious. So there's deep systemic issues. Most of, you know, the difference between here and like a Birmingham, in Jefferson County or Shelby County or you know, Huntsville or anywhere else in the state that's industrialized is the offshore oil and gas. And that offshore oil and gas risks Mobile County tipping across the threshold of what's considered attainment or non-attainment of the Clean Air Act. So you go to Dallas-Fort Worth or Atlanta, Birmingham for many years was non-attainment. So you kind, of, you kind of see, if you're in those places, you can hear about how the federal government is present and looking over each air permit in a really aggressive way to deal with the non-attainment. But when a county is in attainment, then they don't have the authority to look aggressively the way that they would otherwise. And there are mechanisms, and we use those mechanisms for each permit, the Weaver facility, falls under a specific, because it's a minor source, it should be a major source, and that was our argument from day one. But the state was able to, anyway, like I said, lots of legal hooks. I could go on and on about that place, but uh, why are they persisting? So, 
And I'm gonna start with what you were talking about, right? So, cause I was, this also the same issue with the concrete plant in Birmingham that's uh, just so happens to be owned by the brother-in-law of Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, and it's a whole thing. Well, one of the things, and, I, and he asked me about HR 40, which is the bill to study reparations, right? So it's the first step, right? And the reason I mentioned that concrete plant is because when you think about a city like Mobile, right, or majority black city like Birmingham, right? Those taxpayers are subsidizing those businesses, those concrete plants. Now, uh, in most cases, you want to, right? Like, you want to have a subsidization of businesses so people can have jobs, right? But when I say subsidize, I don't know, like, when they come in, they get a tax break, right? Or we don't think about this. Like, we pay for the water. Like, that business doesn't, like, pay the bill. We pay for the pipes that, that funnel the water in there. Regular people pay for those. Like, we, me and you and everybody else who pays their water bill pay for those pipes. We pay for the roads that trucks drive on. We pay for the federal, our federal taxes subsidize the power grid. So we pay, pay for the electricity, right? And if they don't serve those communities, why can't we stop them from using the stuff that we pay for, right? Now, how does that relate to reparations, right? Like all of that stuff we was talking about, what, just think about this. Remember I said South Carolina was a majority black state from 1638 until 1940. And it still, you know, has a, a large number of black people, as does the state of Alabama, right? So we talk about reparations for slavery. I think about after slavery. Like I've long held that the money due after slavery might be more than all the money for slavery. Doing slavery. Just think about this, right? So think about all of those black people who pay taxes and couldn't attend the schools that those white kids paid for. Couldn't attend Auburn, couldn't attend the University of Alabama until like my mama generation, our mama's generation. We subsidize that. Why we can't get our money back? Right? Think about all of, not just like the secondary education and the, the college education, but those K through 12 schools. And then we had to build our own too. Right? Think about all of the soldiers, the black soldiers who went and fought in World War II and couldn't get the GI Bill. Why we can't get our money back? Think about all of those parks we paid for that black people couldn't sit in. Think about all those water fountains. Think about all those water fountains we paid for. Think about all those libraries we paid for that we couldn't use. All those public utilities, all of those public facilities that black people paid for all of those years after slavery. Federal, our federal tax dollars that we couldn't have Think about the red line of the bank. Like, so banks are federally insured, right? So the government has enough money from our federal taxes to insure those banks up to a certain amount. I think it increased from $100,000 to $250,000 in like the early 2000s, right? But all of those white people who could use those banks, because the, the, the Fair Banking Act passed in 76. Until 76, they could stop women and black people from going to a bank, from using a bank. 1976, I was alive. So just think about this, right? All of the white people in America had economic security that we paid for, right? Think about social security, right? Certain, in the, initially, certain jobs were excluded from social security jobs that black people have had. Um, domestic workers were excluded from social security, right? You think you take you, you, taxes out of their checks and everything, they couldn't get social security. So why can't we get all of that money back? And I, uh, it is not just the theft, right, that 
it was taken from us, but we have to remember, just like that concrete pan, we subsidize all of this wealth that we see around us that white people got. White people, these fortunes could have not been built if not for the tax dollars and security that we afforded, the banks that they put their money in, the schools that educated their kids, the books they read, and every road that they walked on. We paid for that. And we didn't get to use them. So HR 40 studies that and then really, like we know the figure now, like we've come up with a calculated figure, it's about $13 trillion. And the thing is, if, again, back to what I was talking about earlier, the reason they try to make these stories illegal is because there's an economic incentive to forget it. We don't even talk about all of that stuff. Right? Not because it's uncomfortable, because there's a price tag attached. And if it was any other group in America, Right, they would they would be forced to do something like, or at least try. Right, the indigenous people of America, they were not fairly compensated for. Well, like, I mean, all this land was stolen from them, so you know what I'm saying. But like, America like put forth a bad faith effort, like you know, a disingenuous robbery effort, but it said at, the, at least there was the acknowledgement that we know we stole y'all stuff, right? <laughs> because they could not, one thing is those indigenous people did not let, would not, still will not let America forget, right? People like them, yeah, they will not let America forget, right? And I think that is the thing that we have to remember. Like, the studies are important. They just fill our heart and make us feel good and pass down to our children. Not as a cost, there's stuff that they owe us attached to those things. There's an economic value to our stories, and that's why they keep trying to erase them. actually to go back to the conversation that we were having about the black towns and settlements and people sort of saying that we were in this position to do for ourselves. Um, so it comes from this idea that with General Sherman, when he was talking to the ministers before the end of the Civil War, and the ministers said to him, and he said, well, what do you want? And they said, we want our own land, and we want for y'all to leave us alone. Right? And so I think that when we talk about Africatown, we talk about Hobson City, Alabama, we talk about Baptist Hill and Demopolis, Alabama, we talk about all these communities, these 1,200 black towns and settlements, I think it, the conversation, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts about this conversation, that there were and are black people who really do believe that our proximity to whiteness never saved us, will not save us, and so we, but we lean on that history to say we did have insurance companies, we did have banking institutions, we did have photography studios, we did have a black Wall Street, we did have hotels and theaters and savings and loans, and there were communities where we could grow up and never see a white person. And it's not that we didn't know that our money was being divested. It wasn't that we didn't know that our, tax, that our vote was being disenfranchised, and it wasn't that we weren't fighting for those things but we were also in communities where we were literally surrounded by love, where our domestic workers and the folks that we had who were general laborers or whoever you want to say, were going out into the world and saying, when I go home, I'm going home to Africa town. And I'm going to be around my people, you know? And I think that there's something to be said about, I mean, I listen to everybody in here talking about amen and hallelujah tonight because Africa Town is a place worth loving and saving and has always been since it was founded. Now the reason that we got here and the reason my ancestors, I don't come from Africa, my ancestors are not 
I'm not a descendant of the Potilda, but my people are Alabama, so before Alabama was Alabama. And I can tell you that my people love this soil and love the communities that we have, and we understand the vices and the devices that were used to disempower our communities. And I think that's very different than sort of going out into the community and going out and saying, everything, the grass is greener and the ice is colder and all this stuff, and we're clawing for this. I mean, so I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that, and then I'm also curious to hear about your thoughts about what the administration is doing with regard to not only giving sort of more money and investing in this idea that we need to preserve the black towns and settlements, but also what the Department of Transportation is doing with regards to the way that highways have been run through our community since time immemorial. So those are my two thoughts and questions and whatever. So. Oh, well, I will say that, uh, you know, I always remind people, like, when we say, this is what black people need to do. We need to do for us. Like, there's never been a thing, like, the whole list of the things that black people need to do we all we did it all and then they burned it down or tore it up or whatever so like and then so th the idea of proximity to whiteness is something that black people collectively ever strive for it's not really true right like still today most black people live around black people Today, to this day, right? 60% of black children attend majority of black schools, right? So, I mean, really it's not a thing that black people ever strived for. Now these communities, whenever there is a measure of economic independence, there is, a, you know, an effort to dismantle it or own it from outside those communities, right? Because again, this is in capitalism, capitalism in a capitalist country, competition is a threat, right? Um, and, you know, we like to mythologize stuff like uh, Black Wall Street. No, you, you know, do you know what Green, the name Green, the Greenwood area was named after? It was named after an area in Tuskegee. Like, it was a bunch of Black Wall Street. It was a Black Wall Street in North Carolina, which was known as Black Wall Street before Tulsa. It was more prosperous than Black Wall Street. Like, um, so, these ideas of things that Black people need to do often accompany the, we when we say them, we forget about the stuff that, one, we did them, and so we shouldn't have to do them. We pay taxes too. Like, we shouldn't have to strategize against white people not killing us. Like, what can we do so they won't steal our money? Right? Like, I mean, it's natural to have locks on your house. But if you got to sit by the window with a shotgun, like, that's not natural. Right? So, you know, they call it, a, they like to call it a victim mentality. But, at a certain point, you gotta realize, like, why they keep trying to come through the window to steal our stuff, right? Like, again, we also have to realize that either accept the fact that we are and will always be surrounded by marauders, or accept the fact that, like, we have to change the marauders, not us. So the administration, <laughs> it's undeniable that there are very real opportunities uh, for communities today that weren't there or years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago to address generational intentional harm uh, to low-income communities of color and black communities in particular. That's in the context of this place, what we lack is local partnerships with the institutions, 
that would drive the consensus towards something of a nature of like re-examining what Africatown Boulevard is in itself. So we know that the, the Mobile consensus is to build the Mobile River Bridge and to toll it. That's how they, they want to pay for it. We know that tolling that bridge is going to push toll aversion traffic right through the heart of residential Africatown because they built that interstate highway, hazardous cargo bypass at grade right in front of Union Baptist Church. So there's this opportunity, right, to lean into the administration to say, smite that bridge, fix Africatown Boulevard. You know, it, it, I don't, there's a lot of people that feel like the bridge is a good idea for all kinds of reasons. People of all shapes, sizes, colors are invested in the leisure economy in Baldwin County. Totally all in for their, their future. They're, they're investing over there and they think connecting the bridge will enrich them and what they're trying to do and see what the outcomes are over there because it's got, it's faster growing than Mobile County. Now, how we get this local government, this, you know, thing of a local government, the city council in Mobile and the, the administration and Mobile County and the, the South Alabama Regional Planning Commission and the Metropolitan Planning Organizations to come to some alternative consensus that when they've already reached this consensus and it's been met, meted out for a decade, the whole, all these conversations about how do we get to this point where they're at today is the consensus for that. It can all be thrown away again. It's not like it hasn't been before. But how do we fix, it's still the same question, how do we fix Africatown Boulevard? If we don't have the local government willing to partner with, with a serious commitment to deal with Africatown, the dangers of Africatown Boulevard as, as itself, as it is today, uh, to, to go after and build capacity, for that whole conversation, because it's, it, these are competitive grants. They're not just, the administration wants to give out the money because it makes the administration look good and responsive to concerns, but they're not gonna go into hostile territory to try to build a consensus where there is no consensus. So it really, it, it falls back on us to figure this pathway out and to make the local politicians abide. That's power. This, these sorts of convenings are about building power. But that you know the consensus for what to do about Africatown Boulevard isn't perfectly crystal clear. We have a general consensus among the you know the, all the nonprofits in the community that want to see traffic slowed. They want to see a uh, boulevard style reintroduction where there's a separation, where there's uh, more lights, where the traffic is uh, the hazardous cargo is allowed to go somewhere else, uh, which will require a bridge because they can't go through the tunnels. You know, all these things have, there's complex consequences. And if you're talking about, so some people discuss building a, a bridge from, if y'all know the geography, from Telegraph Road Bridge that goes over Telegraph Road and the Norfolk Southern Line, building a bridge from there to the Afri base of the Africatown Bridge, you're talking another two or three billion dollar project with the Mobile River Bridge already being a multi-billion dollar project and we are, struggle, struggle, struggle to get that off the ground at all. So, yeah, th there's a lot to discuss here. Okay. It's really complicated. Can I ask a question? How much of that, all of that stuff you just explained, could be fixed by just people valuing black people's lives and history as much as everything else? Everything. Everything. And... Uh, would there be an African Boulevard? Right. Uh, well, the, the whole history is so. We, we, there was a the African Boulevard's not. It wasn't made a hundred years ago. It was made in the nineties. Th there was a robust resistance to Africatown Boulevard. The the Progressive League was on record trying to get Africatown Boulevard changed. Jesse Norwood advocated for it to stay the way it is today. The Mayor Pritchard then. You know these these things have long histories. And it's complicated, right? Why did why why did those people not fight the way I feel like you know I would wish that 
they would have. Not, you know, what and what do we do about it today? Really, in my opinion, I'm, I'm, I think in terms of direct action. It's a road. Traffic moves. That's what it wants to do. How to make it unattractive to traffic moving is the answer to the question. Leverage what we have, you know? Slow traffic down by any means necessary. There's a lot of options. But slow it down for the kids. Slow it down for the heritage tourism potential that we know exists there that's stifled because it's dangerous to get out and try to walk around there. Slow it for the church folks that want to walk across the street after services to go visit ancestors in the cemetery safely. There's an old joke that if you tell white people that there's a rare turtle in a black neighborhood, <laughs> that they won't mess it up. But if you just tell them there's black people there, they'll do what they want to with it. And like, that's, listening to you reminds me of that. Like, it's just black people. Like, they literally, I mean, what you're describing is the, at, at its foundation is a lack of care about black people. A fundamental lack of care about black people and the life and how these choices affect the lives of these black people in this in this part of town. Can we get some turtles? The red belly turtles are the ones that I mean, what you're saying is so true. The interstate system from Miami to California was slowed down for about 10 years in Pascagoula because there were turtles and they would not complete that interstate. Mm. We need turtles. That is so true. We need some turtles. turtles. That's what I'm telling y'all, get the turtles. Well, thank you all so much. Thank you for coming out. Thank you to our guests. Thank you. Thank you. Let's give them another round of applause. That was a beautiful program. We touched on so many topics today. We touched on environmental justice, economic justice, and how we can move our culture forward socially and politically. And I want you to consider what am I doing and what can I do in the future to make a difference for my future lineage. Um, so, reminder, the Clotilda Descendants Association mission is to honor our ancestors, preserve our culture, landmarks, and legacies, and educate future generations of descendants in the community. And we want to thank Michael Harriet and Ramsey Sprague for everything that they have contributed to the advancement of our mission. Thank you all for coming out to our 2024 landing event cocktail reception. We hope to see you in the morning at the landing event ceremony under the Africa Town Bridge. It will be a beautiful, maybe a little rainy morning, so bring your umbrellas, get prepared, and we will see you there. Thank you so much for coming.